Only a fighter knows what goes through the mind before a fight. The preparations, the rituals to mask the fear. Fear of these last moments of uncertainty before it's time to face the crowd. It's the late 1400s in Tudor England and the fight is on. A knight is born and bred to fight. Today, new research is uncovering the world of the medieval tournament and the fury of the combat on foot. Exploring how the Tudor knight fought for money and renown among his peers. Shedding light on a time when war and sport were one and the same, and the honor of a knight depended on his skill with weapons in the ultimate martial art of the Middle Ages. A knight is taking on superhuman ability. The disfigurement and scars were, were terrible and obviously a sign of great uh, experience. They are wearing their arms and weapons of war and they're, and they're dying just as in battle. Throughout history, men and women have faced one another in personal combat. At close quarters, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. They fought for honor, to settle bitter disputes, for prowess, to prove courage and skill, and for sport, to win glory and respect. From the pageantry of the medieval tournament ground, through the deadly rituals of duelists on the field of honor, to the savage backstreet arena of the bare knuckle prize ring. It's these worlds that Fight Club explores. The Tudor period in England began with Henry Tudor's bloody victory at Stoke Field in 1487. It brought to a close decades of terrible civil war known as the Wars of the Roses, and the new king was crowned Henry VII. The tourney, or tournament, was the ultimate martial arts competition throughout the medieval period. It was confined to the upper levels of society, the knights, only wealthy aristocrats could afford the vastly expensive armor, weapons, and retainers needed to take part. A knight has huge cultural importance. He's, he's not just a warrior, he's a lord, he's a leader of men, he's a symbol. Uh, he's a heroic symbol. Karen Watts is senior curator of European armor at the Royal Armouries in Leeds. She's one of the country's leading experts on the study and conservation of armour throughout history. But it's the iconic medieval knight that sparked her interest right from the start. <laughs> I grew up reading an awful lot of, of accounts of chivalrous deeds <laughs> as, as a child. <laughs> and, and I was taken to the Tower of London and there they were, these knights actually, as though they'd stepped out of the pages of, you know, of all of these great chivalric romances of an Arthurian legend. <laughs> and so I connected with it. They were actually men from the past right here in the present with me. Originally based at the Tower of London, the Royal Armouries is, is Britain's oldest museum and is among the oldest anywhere in the world. It houses the UK's national collection of arms and armour, one of the largest in existence, with more than 70,000 items. Well, the amazing thing about armour is that it is material culture. It isn't, it's so much better than just simple written archives that are descriptive and will give you a certain amount of information. The objects talk and the whole thing that I am aiming to do is to get those objects to speak to me. 
and they've travelled from the past, they've had a history. And then aside from that, there's all the great artistry of the object. It's, it's displaying the skills of those craftsmen in the past that we can visibly see and study now. So it's sculpture in steel as well as, as being a piece of bodily protection. It's completely functional. Ivan Williams is a sculptor and artist. He's been studying arms and armour for most of his life, and he's fascinated by the skill and craftsmanship of the people hundreds of years ago who produced them. It's an almost completely forgotten art. As a designer and artist, the most inspiring thing in life, you realise, is nature. Everything around you is so much greater than anything we can ever make ourselves. Animals evolve to be certain things in certain environments, to defend themselves, to be able to move, fly, swim, whatever. Armour evolved to protect people. It's just like growing um, a carapace over yourself and it's made by another craftsman to fit you. It's tailor-made and it has to function. It has to be also strong enough to stop penetration of sharp and pointed weapons. And at the same time, follow the fashion of the day. Ivan Williams has come to the Royal Armouries to meet with Karen and find out more about the way armour was made and see for himself some of the most important surviving pieces in the world. And here we are in store one. The Royal Armoury stores houses just some of the vast collection. You have to remember that the armories isn't just a royal armory collection, but it's also an arsenal. Yes. So it's here that we have the repository of the armour and equipment for all the royal soldiers. So we have many, many rows and, and, and types of the same thing. It's where the armour can be studied and conserved. As a sculptor working in stone and metal, whatever, I just I've been so fascinated by, by armour and by its structure and the way it's been made. I want to know more about the making of it. Uh, I understand the protective qualities and, and the deflection and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's mobile working art to me. Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to get killed, you're going to get killed in the height of fashion. What does that say to you? It's a piece of armour to, to, to protect somebody, but it's a status symbol. It says who you are, where you come from, how much money you've got, you know. Everything about it is so beautiful. Absolutely. If you could afford to have your own armourer, yeah. you were at the very, very top. I don't think anyone realises how hard it is to just do anything with a piece of steel. Yeah, and of course there is, there is a very close relationship between the patron, the man who's going to wear yeah. this, and his armourer. This has to fit perfectly like a second shell yeah. or a second skin. Yeah. But it isn't just him standing like this, wearing no. it, because that's the trouble we have with these. When I keep putting these on, these, these, these wooden mannequins, they're all stiff. You get the impression that you're walking like this because you can't move, whereas, in fact, you can run in a suit of armour, you yes. can leap onto your horse unaided. And all of this has to flex with the whole body. Toby Capwell is the curator of arms and armour at the Wallace Collection in London. He's been immersed in the life of the medieval knight since learning to ride at the age of 11 and competing in his first joust at 19. Alongside his academic career, he competes in medieval tournaments in Europe and America, both jousting and in combat on foot. Over decades of careful research and practical experience, he's explored how a knight's armor worked as an integrated system. The story of armor is as old as the story of warriors and goes back probably all the way to the Stone Age. But give us four or five thousand years and we end up in the 15th century when the archetypal full plate armor had developed. And this is not a simple thing, covering the human body which moves dynamically in many different ways with plates of hardened steel. And it took several hundred years to develop the perfect human exoskeleton, essentially. And you can study this in libraries and museums all you like. But after a certain point, to really understand it, you need to get inside. There are no manuals or master armorers to consult. The only way to find out is to reproduce medieval armor to the most exacting standards possible and then 
try and make it work on the body. Well, getting a full plate armor on is quite an involved process, and it's not something you do in a hurry. I mean, if I really needed to, I could get this armor on in about 15, 20 minutes. But really, I want to take my time. I want to make sure every single piece is precisely right. And if I'm taking my time, putting an armor on from head to foot takes about an hour. We always fixate on the metal bits, because that's the exciting part, the obvious part of an armor. But what's going on underneath is just as important. Uh, you know, the, the, the garments that you wear underneath the armor are absolutely crucial. And the, the doublet especially, the, the coat that I'm wearing, uh, is essentially a foundation garment. It has, it's very closely fitted, it's got padding in all the right areas, and it also has attachment points for each of the pieces of armor. At the moment, uh, the leg armor is going on, and there are attachment points at the base of the arming doublet to support the upper leg armor. And as you go up, everything has a place. So you haven't got all the individual elements of the armor sliding around all over the place. They click into place, they strap on, they tie on, and are kind of mutually supported. All knights would be aware of the culture of chivalry that surrounds them as a warrior class. And they'd all be aware of what was important, what was thought of as being important. Um, not only being a, a virtuoso fighter, but also being elegant, being graceful, having manners, and you know, never, for example, showing that you're in pain. This is fine-tuned stuff. You have to have it tuned just perfectly. You can see here, you've got around the knee, there's an articulated joint. And that articulated joint moves perfectly with my articulated joint. And if this plate is either slightly too high or slightly too low, the joint in the armor doesn't match up with the joint in Toby, and it stops working well. I start getting uncomfortable, I start getting upset, uh, it stops working as well as it should, and the whole thing starts to fall apart. Look at this turning joint. Isn't that cunning? Uh, 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 that is, I mean, and, and, you know, it, it doesn't look like a piece of tubing. No. It, to do that with a hammer or, or no. whatever tool they use. And there's no gap here. This is no. Because you're trying to avoid the blade catching on, catching on anything. So it swivels perfectly and the whole arm can fold in. That's really nice. And it, I mean, when you bend that, see how that fits around that? It, it, at no point does it lock up. If you straighten no. that down, it'll still move, won't it? Yeah. Yes. There you go. Yeah. You know, so that, to actually sort of work out how it's metal to sort of leave, to do that rollover, because that goes right the way around and around the back from what I've seen of them. And it's really quite chunky metal. So to get that rollover, which, which tapers as well, I mean, it's a beautiful shape, it's even both sides. And then to put this rope form in, the actual line there is difficult enough without sort of trying to put it in with a chisel or whatever. And to get it on, it's, it's, it's a twin line as well. It's been cut in. It's absolutely beautiful everywhere. Um, nothing else but admiration. I just wish they knew how they did it. <laughs> the amount of time one spends in the armor depends on what one is doing. Uh, if it's a tournament, you might spend only an hour or two in it at your part of the tournament. You put it on, you fight, you get off again. In a, in a military campaign, you might be in the armor for days. You might and, and only have a chance perhaps at night to take your part of your body armor off, but if it's a tense situation, you don't know what's happening, you could have to spend days in this, in this uh, equipment. So it needs to fit. If you're spending long, you know, serious amounts of time in it, any little irritation is going to be uh, uh, magnified exponentially. So if I've got a little bit of a lace that's just digging me in the back of the leg, I can put up with that for an hour to joust and then go home. But if I'm in this for a week on campaign, I'm going to be really upset by the end of the first day, and I'm going to be in agony by the next morning. So it, everything's got to be absolutely perfect. When we realize how carefully fitted the armor has to be in order to work as well as it possibly can, we rapidly realize that 
the armorer, this master craftsman, this sculptor in steel, is not just a metal worker. He's also a kind of biomechanic. He has to have an incredible, subtle understanding of the way the human body works. You know, because it is a very subtle and complex thing. It's not just as, as simple as where the shoulders flex and where the elbows bend. There's all kinds of subtle twisting uh, and expanding and contracting of the joints and the muscles that he has to allow for in hardened steel, not the most forgiving of metals. Look at the direction of overlap. Yeah. They're overlapping onto this central metatarsal plate. All those flutes are all in line, even when he's flexed up, the flutes still slide over perfectly. Gauntlets. Right. Now, I brought this one up because it is actually one of my favourites, although it's 15th century. This is remarkable. Perfect. <laughs> now, I only pick the tip up. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Goodness me, that's... that's... Oh, that, that curve around there. That's... And it's elegant and delicate as well, isn't it? Yes. As well as being strong and yeah. armoured. It's so graceful. The armour is also so complex that I couldn't possibly put it on by myself. And just as I have someone to help me get my armor on, he would then put his own armor on and I would have a group of bodyguards around me. We would fight as a unit. Knights never go anywhere by themselves. You know, they have to be individually very skilled, but they also need to work as a team. This is sort of 500 years of evolution for how best to armor the human form. You know, the human form, the skeletal structure, works in a very particular way. But what is the best arrangement of plates? And how does that break down in terms of the proportion of the skeletal structure is a, is a really interesting question. Uh, you know, it's a kind of roll cage in a way. And even if a, a high-powered weapon was to get through all of these layers of steel, it still has to travel a fair way through before it gets to me. Most weapons that hit me are just going to bounce off or slip off or they're not going to grab me. And on the rare occasions that they do gain purchase, you know, there's, there's three or four millimeters of steel they need to go through before they get to me. And they might then encounter a layer of mail and then several layers of textile. And, uh, you know, by, by then, most of that energy is gone. When you start to put on an armor like this and you realize what it can do, you very rapidly understand that a knight is taking on superhuman abilities. You know, he, he can survive terrible physical punishment that would kill an ordinary, unprotected human being. And with the power of his horse, he certainly has strength and speed well beyond what an ordinary human has. The armor can be configured for either combat on horseback or combat on foot. So I tend to be a horseman most of the time, so let's go with that first. Uh, one of the most important pieces of equipment for a 15th century mounted knight was his so-called lance rest. Although it does support the weight of the lance quite effectively, what it's really about is uh, impact. When you lock your lance down onto this, onto this arm, uh, it becomes much more secure, and when you hit someone, the force of the impact goes through your center of gravity, rather than just through your grip. So with a lance rest, I suddenly can hit someone three or four times harder than I would be able to if I didn't have one. Fighting on horseback is a very asymmetrical activity. You've got your reins in one hand, and you've got your weapons in the other hand. So, you know, it's your, the, the left and right side of your body are doing very different things. So that leads to inherent asymmetries in an armor heavily weighted towards fighting on horseback. You really need to wear the strongest visor available. Uh, and that, of course, takes down your ability to see and to breathe and to communicate. But the protection is really essential. Those are sacrifices I'm quite happy to make when people are hitting me in the head with lances. Armour protects you completely, so why on earth did anybody ever get hurt or killed in battle? Henry II dies at yeah. a French tournament because he lifts his visor up to breathe. 
and of course he doesn't close it properly and he gets a splinter full of lance shards into his eye and dies horribly three days later. Do you think that'll fit me? It might do. <laughs> Put down. Oh, great. There we go. With a blade. I'm not going to be able to lift any of these plates up because you're fully, fully protected. But you've still got vision holes here, vision yeah. slits, so that it enables you to see properly. Yeah. Uh, and breathing holes, and breathing holes on either side. I can't see any of the metal now. I'm not aware of this grid because this grid is so close to my eyes. It's like a fencing mask. It actually accentuates my eyesight. I can see clearer. The other thing I'm surprised at is the peripheral vision. I can see right way round, I'll bring my hands round. I can now see my left hand, my right hand without moving my head inside. That's pretty good. <laughs> Which is impressive because you would be in battle formation with, with a, a, a team of knights yeah. next to you, so you can actually see yeah. your fellow knights, but you can also have the breadth of vision to see the knights coming towards you in, yeah. a, in a tourney or a, a mock battle because you can actually encompass everybody coming towards you okay. and then focus in on the one that you're going to charge at with your lance. If I want to fight on foot with the poleaxe or the longsword, I need to wear the armor in a slightly different way. The, beauty, the beautiful thing of, uh, about an armor like this is that it is really quite adaptable and it can serve several different fighting functions. I don't need the same level of asymmetry in the equipment that I have on horseback. Fighting on foot is a much more symmetrical activity. I might be fighting with my right hand, I might be fighting with my left hand, I might be switching all the way through the battle doing different things. So I need more symmetry in the armor. I also need more mobility and less weight on the upper body. I need to be able to jump around. My body is carrying all of this weight. I haven't got a horse to help me. So bringing the weight down, bringing the protection down to a certain extent, but raising the mobility becomes much more important on foot. So we can use the same helmet for foot combat, but to optimize the, the, uh, the, my fighting ability, we're going to put a different visor on that is specially conceived for fighting on, on foot in particular. So it's giving much better visibility. Uh, it's, covering, uh, it's covering the face in quite a different way. I can breathe much better in this helmet because I'm going to be breathing harder jumping around on foot. Men change when they wear armour. There's something about the way that they suddenly will stand and hold themselves. There's certainly immense belief in their invincibility. You can't be a knight in armour unless you are immensely aggressive and have immense self-confidence, immense physical strength and the knowledge of how to use that physical strength to its fullest capacity. They will have been trained from the, from the age of seven onwards in how to wear the armour and move in the armour because you can do all movements in armour but you do have to learn how to roll your shoulder around so that you don't lock your, your shoulder defence inside your breastplate. You have to learn that the breastplate is pressing against your chest so you need to breathe deep in the diaphragm. You're overheating so you have to learn how to take a number of controlled breaths all the time. You're in this steel shell that is in, on the one hand protecting you but on the other hand is constricting you. They have to know how to overcome all that and believe and know precisely how they can move and fight. With the armour working as an efficient system, it's time for the next stage. Torbay has to be able to fight in it. The sword has many advantages. It's a powerful cutting weapon. But as soon as you have people clad entirely in hardened steel, cuts are no longer going to do anything. The sort of attacks that I would use if my opponent was uh, unarmored or wearing minimal armor, cuts to the face, cuts to the body, are not really going to do anything against him at all. And a sword can be adapted for fighting in armor, 
but it has to be used in a very different way. Very often you, you read about what was called half sorting technique, where actually you're shortening a long sword like this and gaining much more close, very specific control of the point. And the reason to do this is so that you can get in the gaps of the armor, into the face, into the underarms, getting prizing between the plates rather than trying to pierce them uh, themselves. You know, the, the center of a knight's armor, certainly in an Italian armor like this, is crossbow proof, it's longbow proof, and it's very frequently firearm proof. So you're not going to get the point of a sword through it. When you're considering the gaps that might present themselves in an opponent's armor, uh, sometimes the armor responds in some quite interesting ways. For example, if I was going to try and get between the plates of, on Dom's chest and his neck, if I'm trying to go underneath there, I hit the stop rib that's been applied to the breastplate. They're expecting weapons to be sliding up and they get caught on this applied plate under there. So at the last minute, the armor has saved him from a lethal thrust into his throat. Even if this stop rib were to fail, he still got a couple layers of mail under there as a last ditch attempt before I get to him. There were different weapons used in the combat on foot. Swords, sometimes spears or javelins. The most fearsome form of combat in the tournaments involved the polex, or more correctly, the polex. It's important to say something about the, the word itself. This is Paul Axe, P-O-L-L-A-X-E, or A-X, um, not pole. It's not a pole weapon, it's a Paul weapon. It's a head axe. What that term actually means is probably somewhat debatable. It's been explained by saying, well, it's a weapon for cracking people's heads, but actually you do a lot of other things with it. Uh, it could be uh, explained simply because it's a very long axe, as opposed to a wood axe or something, it should be as high as your head. So maybe that's the derivation of the word. It's hard to say. And a lot of different uh, heads can be uh, integrated into a, a weapon like this. This one, for example, has an axe blade combined with a long, sharp fluke on the back. And of course, the top spike. It's a, it's a strange kind of multi-tool in a way. Whereas another very common variant is to retain that long curved spike, but instead to have a hammer head, uh, a crushing weapon on the other side. The axe blade again, though more useful than a sword blade, uh, is probably of limited value against a fully armed knight. So switching it round to the beak is probably, if you want to hurt someone, probably the thing to do. A lot of the best and most effective uh, Paul axe fighting technique uh, spends most of its time with the cue, or the tail of the axe. If I'm blocking a blow, I can then use the leverage of the axe to push my opponent over. If it's a tournament, push him out of the ring. If it's a battle, push him down on the ground. The popularity of tournaments in Britain varied throughout the Middle Ages. In times of famine or plague, they were less common. And during wartime, it sometimes flourished. It often depended on the king. Under the warlike Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, Tourney became extremely popular. The tournament was good training for war. These are martial games. And the way that war is fought is with mounted knights on horseback with their lances couched under their arm, passed over their horse's neck, and you pass left side to left side. And it's a team. It's, it became a team sport because war is lines of mounted knights charging against each other. Certain knights would gain in power and dominion through their reputation on the tournament field. William Marshall did that. He was a minor knight who became one of the most powerful men in, in, in England because he was successful on the tournament circuit. But right at the beginning, they are wearing their armors and weapons of war and they're, and they're dying just as in battle. So they're banned and prohibited. There's a number of edicts 
that are led out by kings and popes, banning tournaments. However, the French carry on fighting with, uh, in the same way and having tournaments, and it's noted that they are actually braver in battle and more successful. So at this point, this is where we begin to see that tournaments began to be licensed under Richard I, for example, and rules and regulations are brought in of what equipment that you're going to wear, what weapons you're going to use. Gradually, they bring in more and more rules and more and more protective clothing, and pro that is to say protective armour. So they wear their armour for war and then they start wearing reinforces on top of it to give that extra added protection. Former surgeon Mick Crumplin is an expert on medical techniques throughout history. He's researched the injuries inflicted by different types of historical combat. I would love to have done a post-mortem on a, a, a lifetime soldier in medieval times. I think you would probably find a, a lot of healed broken bones of the arm and, and wrist and even the, the hands and obviously injuries around the head and neck. If you're hit by a blade or, or anything on the face, there was no accurate suturing. So the disfigurement and scars were, were terrible and obviously a sign of great uh, experience. No doubt a spike would go through plate armour. It would uh, with sufficient force, I'm sure, but a lot of um, metal protection presumably dented and you got enormous contusion injuries inside. And in the head that would be a problem because uh, although you can... Um, not have a skull fracture, you can inflict enormous damage on the soft jelly-like brain because in normal consistency the brain is very soft and if it gets shaken about and jarred, what we call contra-coup injury, in other words you get hit on one side and the brain rams against the other side of the skull, you get tremendous internal disruption uh, on a microscopic level which impairs function. There are certainly records of people getting broken bones, which I think is the most common, when plates and lames can be prized apart on arms and legs, which is often the case, then there are some very severe limb injuries are the most common. The wound man is quite remarkable. Uh, it's unique in showing the various types of ghastly wounds that can be inflicted on both military and civil people. And uh, it underpins the kind of basic teaching that surgeons had of the kind of wounds they had to treat, because obviously the effects of each type of wound were different on the sufferer. So you had uh, contused wounds, which really means bruising and soft tissue damage, but the tissue surface remaining intact. Then you have l lacerated wounds, where for instance, uh, a cannonball or a shot will pass through your tissues and leave bits hanging around and it's torn into you. And then you have punctured wounds, which are inflicted by sharp pointed weapons, such as the long sword. And then you have the slashing wounds, which inevitably mainly fall around the head and neck. So these are the four types of wounds that we're familiar with in combat. In the early years of the 16th century, tournament fighting was on the wane. Yet the arrival of King Henry VIII in 1509 turned its fortunes around. Physically strong and athletic, Henry was the epitome of the fighting monarch. He trained in the knightly martial arts all his life and was himself a keen competitor at tournaments. Yet he also knew their usefulness politically. In cementing alliances and displaying prestige and power to would-be rivals in Europe, the era of medieval tourney reached its zenith under Henry VIII. In 1520, he staged the greatest ever known. For a few days, a quiet area of rural northern France was transformed. Incredibly glorious, wonderful, spectacular tournaments were held all the time and had been from the 14th century through to the 16th century. We have a very interesting and tight diplomatic and political situation. You have got Charles V as Holy Roman Emperor, inheriting directly from his grandfather, Maximilian. You have Francis I in France, and you have Henry VIII in England. Now, Henry VIII is married to Catherine of Aragon, who is Charles V's aunt. So, 
He's already made that political, political link there. But you have these three powers who are looking closely at each other. And Henry is trying to form an alliance with France. So he holds this glorious tournament in carefully constructed neutral ground. So Henry VIII travels to the Pas de Calais, which is, of course, part of England and stays there. Francis I remains in France. And in their two towns of Ardringin, between them is a neutral area. It's just fields. It's nothing but fields to begin with. Then they start dressing it. So a whole palace is built. It's got glass. It's got s statues and sculptures all the way around it. Um, there are wonderful tilt yards are made. A tree of honour is constructed, symbolically and politically entwining the two great um, trees symbolising England and France, on which were hung the shields for the combats. Such was the opulence of the rich pavilions and banners that it became known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold. It was far more than just a tournament. Henry was determined to impress. The tournament ground itself was the size of a small town. As well as the combat arenas, there were hundreds of tents and marquees, fully fitted with apartments and chambers for their royal residence. Painted to look like they were made of stone. There were even silver fountains, which flowed with red and white wine. An amazing amount of luxury was dispensed on just this incredible scene setting. And you think, well, this is all about play acting, this is all about pomp and diplomacy, wonderful parades and processions as, they, as each king enters every day, as the queens are there. They break off each Sunday for special masses, and it's all done with glorious pomp and circumstance. But the one thing you have to remember is that these two kings genuinely loved fighting. They had never met each other before. They were curious about each other. They were curious about each other's physicality. Henry commissioned a special suit of armour in which to compete in the combat on foot. It can still be seen in the royal armouries today, complete with telltale mistakes in its decorations, brought about when the armour had to be modified to suit last minute changes in tournament rules. Henry VIII founds his royal workshop at Greenwich and he has as his master armourer Martin van Rooyen. And Martin van Rooyen creates for Henry VIII a magnificent, fully articulating steel armour where every piece locks into every other. If you look at it, the helmet locks into the collar that locks down the, into the thighs, that lock down into the, into the feet. The arms are all locked place. This is an armour that doesn't have any chinks in it. No chinks in this armour whatsoever. It's a glorious fitting armour all the way around him. It's a magnificent feat. Three months before the tournament, the French changed the rules. Now, they were entitled to do this, and they specified a different weapon. Now, this means that they're now going to use the big two-handed sword. They're not going to use the poleaxe. They don't need this fully articulated armour. This armour is almost ready. It's still black from the hammer, and the last piece is waiting to be put on it, which is the standing neck guard for the shoulder. And today we can just see the holes where it would have been. And they have to go in and they have to cancel it. And Martin van Rooyen has now got three months to come up with an armour with a skirt. Well, he couldn't make an armour from scratch in three months. So they had to look around for pieces that Henry already had and adapt it. So the great bassinet helmet, one of the most crucial elements, has got Italian armour's marks on the back. So it has clearly been an Italian piece that the king already had and it's been placed on him. You know, they've then created that fully symmetrical armour, symmetrical arm defences, leg defences and this big skirt, which they've then decorated hurriedly. They start off very well and they run out of time to do the, to do the decoration. They have managed to put a virgin and child on one side of the helmet and on the shoulder, and a St George and the Dragon on the other helmet and shoulder, and the collar of the Order of the Garter around the neck, 
though they don't quite finish doing all the decoration at the back, but the front looks fine. And best of all, the garter itself is etched around the knee. So they, they've imitated that as well. So they have given the king Tudor and English symbolism, and particularly of the famous Order of the Garter, the great Order of Chivalry. So it is most definitely decorated, and he would have appreciated that it would have been decorated with all the emblems that described himself. Both kings would have fought each other, except that at the Field of Cloth of Gold, it was carefully arranged that neither king would fight each other. They would fight knights from each other's court, because they would have gone for it for real. One king would have, would have lost, and there'd been an immense loss of face. But both of them were competing for real, and both of them are t paying very close attention to how the other is performing. And on one day, Henry VIII takes part in the archery, because longbow archery is regarded as an admirable skill for a man, not only just a yeoman of England, but also for a king. But for the French, it isn't. So Francis I takes little or no part, and Henry VIII does very well. Buoyed by this wonderful élan success, he then challenges Francis I to a wrestling match, which Francis agrees to instantly. And this shows how much the two of them actually want the combat, despite all of the diplomacy. And you can imagine all the courtiers going, no! So the two kings wrestle, and unfortunately, Henry VIII is quickly thrown by the French king, who is extremely good at this particular sport, and Henry slopes away in some anger. <laughs> Nobody has ever asked me who won the Field of Cloth of Gold. <laughs> it was deemed that each, many individual knights had done extremely well, particularly the kings. I mean, genuinely, the, those two kings did joust and fight extremely well. There's no doubt about it. It went down in history as the most magnificent tournament ever held. The great spectacular marked the beginning of the end of the era of the medieval tourney. Tournaments continued after Henry's reign, even into the early 17th century. Yet none was ever as memorable as the glittering field of the cloth of gold. This was because it came at the end of many tournaments that were famed and renowned, starting from the 15th century in France, in Germany, in Burgundy especially, and in England. And they had each been known for one thing or another thing, and stories were told. And somehow, in everybody's mind, the best ever was the Field of Cloth of Gold. That became the epitome of all tournaments and was recounted and told. And Edward Hall produced a chronicle in which he described everything in lavish, glorious detail, all the costumes, what the horses were, the feathers, the wine, every single detail. And people talked about it and recounted it for not just the few years that passed, but for decades that passed, for the next century that passed. An extraordinary thing is that it still holds sway today. As the era of gunpowder took hold, the role of the armoured knight on the battlefield diminished, and so in turn, of the tournament of arms. Now, hundreds of years later, the medieval knight, armed with sword or lance, remains a symbol of the far-flung times of the reign of chivalry.